All right, kids, welcome to the the dungeon here in downtown St. Louis. This is my humble abode, and uh, this is where I'm doing my Big Easy's Big Five this week. We're not writing them down. We're not typing it out for you to read. We're going to make it even more simpleton for you, uh, except with the caveat that you have to look at an ugly face the whole time while you do it, um, as I just burped there. Anyway. Uh, here's my big five this week. This is my Big Easy's Big Five All Star Break notes for uh, Major League Baseball and really everything around. Point number one, uh, and and hopefully these are all things that either you uh, you don't know or maybe even if you did know, probably some things that would be cool to talk about at the water cooler this week. Point number one, the cards at forty six and forty at the break have the exact same record, believe it or not, as they did last season after 86 games. 46 and 40. It's tough to believe that, really, because we all kind of thought that this team was struggling a little bit more than last year's team was. But what we end up forgetting is that, you know, John Moselock made a lot of moves in that second half, and we needed an Atlanta Braves collapse to see what happened last year. Things really fell into place. John Mozeliak deserves a lot of credit for that, no doubt. But the Atlanta Braves also did their part, too. I think we're at the point where we're going to need to see something like that again. There looks to be not one, but two teams, and I do include the Pirates in that mix, that may be sticking around for a while. It's tough for me to think that the Pirates are going to stick around just because they're the Pirates. But they're better than last year. Just strictly on paper, they're better than last year. It's it's tough not to think that's going to be the 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 case uh, you know, as the season as the second half of this season goes on, and they won't collapse like they did in the second half of last season when they were uh, very good all the way through the month of July. Point number two, on our, or yeah, is that what we're calling these? Yeah, uh, note number two. Yeah, what I, I said that these were all star notes, right? Buster Olney came up with something in his blog that I thought was very good. I thought was very interesting. As much as I think the Cardinals are the team most well, oops, excuse me, most well put together for a good run in the uh, second half of the year, just roster wise. Even though I still do think they probably need uh, a, a starter and or a reliever, is. Uh, the way their schedule is put together in the second half of the season. Consider this. Of the three teams that are vying for a National League Central Division title right now, the Cardinals have the toughest way to go in terms of opponents. The Reds have 77 games left, 42 at home. The Pirates have 77 games left, 38 are at home. The Cardinals have 76 games left, 38 of those are at home. So they have the same amount of home games left as the Pirates do and four less home games than the Reds. Here's where it gets a little more interesting, though. You know, the home and away stuff, you know, some people will say that's inconsequential or less consequential than I'm making it, and I, will, I won't argue those people. But here's one that I think is even better. Games against teams with a plus 500 record remaining on their schedule. The Reds, out of our 77 games, 24 of them are with opponents with a plus 500 record or better. Just 24. The Pirates, 26 of their last 77 are against teams currently with a plus 500 record. The Cardinals, 37 games out of their last 76 are against teams with a plus 500 record. That's 13 more than the Reds. That's 11 more than the Pirates. That's going to make it even that much tougher, no matter what John Moselock does at the deadline, to come back and win this division. Really, what's going to have to happen is that, you know, the, the Cardinals are just going to have to play better in close games. And really what that, I mean, at least that's, that's what I think, and that's note number three. The win against the Marlins on Sunday the final game before the All-Star break, was just their third win this season. Third, where they were tied or behind going into the ninth inning. Now, 
that doesn't seem like an alarming number, except when you compare it to this stat, and that is the number of times the Cardinals have lost after being tied or being ahead after eight innings. You know how many times that's happened? Eight. Eight times they've lost when tied or ahead after eight innings. Three times, only three have they won when tied or behind after eight innings. I think that's uh, notable, and I think that says a lot about this bullpen. And, uh, and something needs to be changed there. That's point number three. Point number four, boy, I sound like a TLR hater this week. I sound like a Tony La Russa hater, and I hate it. It, it. it doesn't make me feel good inside at all. But I got another one for you. Tony La Russa screwed up on who he picked as a starter for the All-Star game. Should have been R.A. Dickey. Should have been the guy with 12 wins. Should have been the guy who has a better ERA than Matt Cain. It should have been the guy who has a better whip than who doesn't, and who doesn't like a good whip? A whip that's better than Matt Cain. It's just, it, it, it just should have been. And, and on top of all that, not that this matters, but on top of all that, it's a feel good story. It's a feel good story. It's the all star game. You know, but I'll, I'll even leave that. That's a consolation. The point is, the stats are better for Ari Dickey. And, and well, you know, you get the the pitcher versus you know the pitcher catcher. The battery is all San Francisco, and that helps. I mean, really, is that what this comes down to? Really, I'm sure. Oh well, and then here's the next one I get. Well, like these catchers have a tough time catching Ari Dickey's knuckleball. Really? Well, if that's the case, then if that if it's if it takes if it's that much of a talent to catch Ari Dickey's knuckleball, then grab a Tolly who can't hit the ball worth a crap for the New York Mets and grab him because that should mean that he's a huge All Star himself, as far as I'm concerned. But anyway, I thought Tony La Russa screwed up on that. Ari Dickey was the best pitcher in the National League in the first half. He deserves the honor. And it's a shame he didn't get it. And I just say it feels like I'm a TLR hater. I'm not. I just think he screwed up here. And I also think he screwed up with not picking Johnny Cueto for the All-Star team. Uh, my last one, my note number five, All-Star break note number five in Big Easy's Big Five. The only thing more annoying than hearing Chris Berman for the umpteenth year in a row say back, 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 back are all the people on Twitter that get annoyed by it. It's the Skip Bayless effect, folks. You are feeding the monster. If you don't like it, don't feed the monster. I don't, to be honest with you, I don't really mind Berman either way. It's not that big a deal to me. You know, I think it's kind of a shtick, but we all have our sticks. I have mine. But you feed the monster when you talk about how annoyed you are by it. And frankly, that's more annoying to me than Chris Berman himself. That's Big Easy's Big Five All-Star Break Notes. Thanks for watching.